Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm the host for today's session, and uh, we're excited about uh, having two guest presenters who uh, can share a lot of wisdom in the next 45 minutes. And as we are uh, in the habit of doing, we'd like to start with a couple poll questions. Appreciate your participation. And these may need a little bit explanation as we do it. But the first question is, according to the 2017 National Electric Code, what time range is selective coordination required down to? So again, no obligation, no penalty for guessing. Give it a shot. Let's see how your results come in. We're going to have a fairly full session today, so make sure you you have all your gears in motion to keep uh, track of what we're doing. So it looks like we need, we're about halfway to the uh, quorum. Let's leave this open another 10 seconds. And again, uh, we try to produce two of these broadcast Thursday sessions a month, and we do appreciate your participation. Okay, so let's share the results. So we have a wide, wide distribution. And we'll get the answer from the presentation as we get into it. The second is, what is typically the largest breaker size that should be designed on a 125 amp panel with a 125 amp main circuit breaker to provide selective coordination in an emergency system? So there's a couple of, I won't say trick questions, trick categories, but this is one that comes up frequently when we're talking about coordination and the need to coordinate an emergency system. And I'm kind of curious to know the exact answer myself. So looking forward to that as we get into the presentation. All right, we're just about there. Let's give this another 10 seconds. Here's how people have weighed in. So uh, big, big separation between the, the most and the least. And then the last, is what advantage does an 800 amp UL approved 891 switchboard with five to six cycle short time duty rating have? So what are the advantages? And this was a little bit difficult to get all this verbiage on the on the question routine. And I apologize if, if you can't specifically separate all the choices there, but give it your best shot. We're lucky to have our two presenters today. They have, I'll share some information with you that uh, will give you some indication of their authority in this, this area of uh, technical expertise. And frankly, it's very impressive. All right, so leave this, let's give this another five seconds. Looks like we're close. Probably slowed down some people just having to read all this. All right. Here's how people have weighed in. Again, I thank you for your presentation, your participation. Well, let's get on with the show. So uh, Joe Dietrich has over 30 years of engineering experience. He's been responsible as the engineer in charge for over 250 arc flash studies during this time, covering a wide range of projects, including hospitals, wastewater treatment plants, military sites, solar, photovoltaic, and wind turbine farms, and the like. Now, these studies have ranged in size from 50 buses to those exceeding 7,000 buses, such as a data center. Joe Kerfoot has over 15 years' experience uh, in design, and as the lead designer in over 150 projects from many sectors, including healthcare, mission critical, and industrial higher, higher education, and he is uh, leading our presentation today. He has been the lead engineer on over 70 analytical studies, including short circuit and arc flash analysis. So with that, let me pass the baton over to Joe Kerfoot. Give me just a second. Joe, you have the podium. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for attending. The selective coordination changes in the NEC have been a large struggle for the industry. And we have been spending a lot of time educating design engineers and equipment vendors 
uh, we are trying to provide some education here, including some tips and tricks to reduce the amount of redesign that we have been encountering. I won't bore you with our experience again, um, but between both of us, we've uh, got about 50 years of experience in the power industry, and both between design and analysis on consulting and design build. For our topics today, we will go through code requirements, rules of thumbs, examples, and then follow up with some questions. So to begin with the code requirements, the intent is not to give a full code review course, but to present the ground rules for selective coordination. When I started in the industry, selective coordination was not really an issue, but over the past few code cycles, it has really evolved. The intent is to localize an outage, for example, a feeder fault on elevator three will only open the breaker to elevator three, and selective coordination will prevent other parallel elevator circuits from opening. So starting in Article 100 with definitions, the intent of selective coordination is clearly defined to the localization of an overcurrent condition to restrict outages to circuits or equipment affected accomplished by the selection and installation of overcurrent protected devices and their rating or setting for the full range of available overcurrents from overload to the maximum available fault current and for the full range of overcurrent protective device operating times, opening times associated with those overcurrents. I want to point out that it is clearly defined now as the full range of current and the full range of time. This applies to many systems, elevators, fire pumps, emergency, legally required, and COPS. We will now look at a few of these in more detail. So in 700.32 for emergency systems, we have emergency system overcurrent devices shall be selectively coordinated with all supply side overcurrent protective devices. I'm not going to read through the entire slide, but want to point out that it does specifically say all supply side devices. Since code permits multiple utility sources, this could also be alternate utilities and may not just be a generator source. Again, in 701.27, with legally required systems, we see all supply side devices. Here, I want to point out, I didn't point it out on the previous slide, but I want to point out that the exception here states selective coordination shall not be required between two overcurrent devices located in series with no loads connected in parallel downstream. So an example of this would be an upstream feeder breaker to a downstream main breaker. Those two would be in series without any parallel loads. Or a primary side branch breaker that is feeding a transformer and then a secondary main, uh, secondary downstream main breaker on the downstream panel, the upstream breaker and the downstream breaker would both be in series without parallel loads. So we will see an example of this later on. Sprinkled in related sections are ground fault protection selectivity requirements, but we will focus this discussion on phase protection. For COP systems, in 708.54, again states all supply side devices. For elevator systems, we have section 620.62 that phrases it slightly different with any other supply side devices. Any other is understood to be the, pa the pathway all the way back to the source. I want to point out that as with series rating of elevator systems, there is no exception in this section for devices in series as we saw previously with emergency or, or legally required. There are also, of course, local AHD requirements 
as some AHAs require selectivity only for the emergency systems and permit miscoordination to take out the parallel normal side. California, for example, only requires selective coordination down to 100 milliseconds on healthcare systems due primarily to the fact that maintenance staff is present around the clock. You will want to confirm your requirements and request a variance early if necessary, which we have seen happen quite a bit over the past few years. So in summary, the NEC requires selective coordination across the full range of time, typically understood to be down to 10 milliseconds or 0.01 seconds for both the normal and alternate source. This requirement can be costly to meet and with, will also require different system topologies than the days of past. Often switchgear and breaker changes can become extremely expensive especially during construction, which we have experienced many times this year. We will see this in some examples later on. So moving on to the rule of thumb. A dozen years ago when I went from Houston to Alaska, I was used to $5 foot longs, but I got cracked up when I saw this sign that showed a five fingers, but $6 foot longs. I understand that now they are $9, so they had to drop the hand. But here, I'm gonna give you only five rules of thumb for building selectivity into the design of your power system. So for the first rule to start out, we have providing fused panel boards. This is always a great choice for your branch panels. It's typically very easy to provide selective coordination with only a two to one ratio when you're using fuses. The second rule of thumb is to reduce the number of levels in your system. So for example, on this uh, single line, this is not the way that you want to design your system to selectively coordinate. I have indicated the number in red for each level to illustrate the upstream, downstream, breakers that are on the same level that may not require selective coordination. So for example, the on level two, the 400 amp feeder to the 400 amp main, they are allowed to overlap with the exception. But in general, we have five to six levels and a whole lot of breakers that will need to selectively coordinate and this will be very difficult in this system. This was an example system that we ran into and a optimal solution to that is often to redesign that system. Now, even though the main breakers have an exception, I would recommend removing the main breakers on feeders or bus risers when they don't meet the ratio test, which we will talk about later, to simplify the system topology. The thing that we want to point out here with the second rule for levels is that the ideal maximum number of levels that you want in your system to selectively coordinate is three to four, as you can see in the revised single line. So for the third rule of thumb for instantaneous adjustability, I broke it up into multiple parts that are very closely related. For 3A, it is necessary at times to provide the next size up frame to get a higher instantaneous setting. For example, instead of using a 200 amp frame and a 150 amp trip, you may need to specify a 400 amp frame with that 150 amp trip. Or instead of a 250 amp frame, you may need to go up to a 600 amp frame so that you can get a higher instantaneous. And we will walk through an example of this later. For three, for three B is, this is to specify breakers that have a high instantaneous or are capable of having the instantaneous turned off completely. And later on in the examples, we will show this. You can see here that this is showing the breaker, uh, this specific breaker can have the instantaneous turned off. For three C, this is, very closely related to 3D, 
in that instead of a typical lighting class panel board, you may have lower down in your system or at your distribution level, you may need to go up to UL 891 boards to get a higher short time duty rating, ensuring that they exceed the short time delay that you're expected for clearing times. And for 3D, we may need to specify all breakers, including parallel loads, that don't require code enforced selectivity with electronic trip units and ZSI. We will define these uh, parallel non code enforced loads later on as last in line breakers for ZSI. The fourth rule of thumb is for ratio. Try to design your system with a minimum ratio of four to six times between levels of, of, for the breaker. So in this example, this is not the way you want to do it. You don't want to use 100 amp mains with 60 amp branch breakers. You don't want to use 200 amp mains with 150 amp branch breakers. You want to have at least a, a shoot for a, at least a four times ratio for a 100 amp branch to a 400 amp to a 1200 amp and so forth. The final and fifth rule is to reduce thermal magnetic breakers in your in series as much as possible. No more than two or three. You will likely also need to reference a manufacturer's selective coordination publication for tested combinations of these breakers. And we will see an example of that. So moving on to the examples, we'll see some examples of using the manufacturer's coordination publications, zone selective interlocking, for selective coordination, adding impedance to your system, and feeder bus risers. I wanted to note that ATS and disconnect ratings do often create a challenge here, but we're not going to go into that. So for the first example with manufacturer coordination publications, I've got here on the screen three of our most common manufacturers that we deal with. And it's extremely important to get a copy of these, these publications. We've got some links here provided. And Joe, if you'd like to mention what you were discussing earlier about Siemens. Yeah, so um, we didn't include Siemens here, but they, they too also have a publication guide. And, and in their publication guide, they were stating, I know um, we've often seen where folks have said, hey, breakers are overlapping or have, might have a slight overlap at the, the edges or the tolerance band of the breakers. And in their uh, one of their recent publications, um, it actually, they state that uh, the outer edges can in fact touch and that because of the dynamic actions of let's say two breakers um, next to each other that um, some very slight overlap can occur um, per, per uh, NEMA standard uh, NEMA ABP 1-2010 uh, and uh, the other thing that we note that both Eaton GE GE slash ABB they, they've recently uh, uh, joined together and Square D uh, have gone through, especially GE ABB with their recent merger, uh, come up with tested combinations for both ABB breakers and GE breakers that do provide a greater degree of selective coordination down to uh, the 0 0.01 time band, uh, not just down to the 100 millisecond time band. So in each of these links here, when you are reviewing these these bulletins, uh, you want to make sure that the tables that you're looking at do in fact qualify either only to 100 milliseconds on the time current curve or down to the 0 0.01 or the bottom of our, our time current curves where we typically see that uh, coordination. And if most people out there have been doing coordination for a long time, know that the instantaneous bands often overlap. With the recent testing that, that all of these manufacturers have done to update their tables, um, they will say that even though you may appear to see an instantaneous overlap, the tested combinations are valid up to the current values uh, specified in those tables. 
and and Joe, I don't know if you have a table. Oh, you have a table on the next uh, two pages down. So let's let's go ahead and hand it back to you. So for this example, we will be using Eaton's publication, and I wanted to point out that there are two sets of tables in the publications typically. Um, as Joe mentioned, there are both full range and 100 millisecond tables. And in this Eaton document at the beginning of the publication, you can see highlighted in yellow here that they make the distinction between the tables that are applicable for total selective coordination and for selective coordination greater than 0.1 or 100 milliseconds. So in this specific example, we will be using the 0.01 second table to check. If we have an upstream 225 amp breaker, I can pick an FD, JD, FDE breaker. I can, select, I can coordinate that with a downstream FD, HFD, or FDC breaker up to either 125 amp or 150 amp. So for a specific example, I may select this 225 amp FDE with a 310 plus electronic trip unit and a downstream FD thermal magnetic breaker. Now, in here, this does allow me with 0.1 second to get within um, a two to one ratio between the upstream 225 and 150. But keep in mind the rules of thumb that were given were primarily for the intent of full range. So instead of 100 millisecond table, we can use the full range tables here. So for this example, if we have an LD electronic trip unit, we can coordinate that with a downstream JD family 125 amp up to a 125 amp breaker. And this is a two to one ratio. The FD can be set as low as 250 amps, and this example is based on a 600 amp frame. It's important to point out that the combination has been tested to fully coordinate up to 12,000 amps fault current at 480 volts, and we will see some PCCs of this. So taking this example and building a time current curve for it, this is what we were looking at. So in this specific example, we have 60,000 amps available fault current. We have a main breaker that's in the LDC 310 plus. It's got a 600 amp frame, a 250 amp trip. And downstream, we have a JDC thermal mag with a 250 amp frame, 125 amp trip. So it may be difficult to see. This is a very fine detail example, but at 11 milliseconds or 0.011 second, we do have miscoordination showing on the TCC at 5,246 amps. But based on table 8C that we were just looking at, it indicates that this is a tested combination up to 12,000 amps. And this is due, again, as Joe mentioned, to the dynamic performance of the breakers as the downstream breaker begins to open, the upstream breaker does not open. Yeah, it's jump back to that, Joe, real quick. Uh, it, it is important to show that the green arrow there is your is your 12,000 amps that was in the table. So we, we drew that in. Typically, you wouldn't see that. Um, on, on your time current curve, uh, unless you had just 12,000 amps and you were doing current cutoff. But we just wanted to show here that, and, and Joe has moved the, the curve up slightly here. If you look at the scale on the right there, that's 0 0.01 is right at the top of the arrow there. So we're actually showing a little bit below the 0 0.01, which is somewhat atypical to show, but it does demonstrate per the table that even though we see some overlap, down below that time, 
the, the pink breaker there is an electronic trip unit style breaker, and it does have some built-in delay and will not necessarily trip. So it would appear, like Joe said, that these two breakers don't selectively coordinate, but according to the tested combination for the full range of time and current, that breaker is good to 12,000 amps to uh, you know, 0.01 seconds. Thank you, Joe, for that clarification. So when we receive a submittal package, almost every job in the past few years, we have needed to go line by line and create tables uh, of uh, as received and provided provide recommended changes to the manufacturer. As you can see in this example, we needed to almost entirely remove the power defense breakers and convert the devices to electronic trip units. And sometimes, often, this includes topology changes. So for our second example, I am going to hand this over to Joe Dietrich and open up the single line diagram to discuss the system that we had to come up with on a specific project. Let me zoom in, and Joe, you can take it away. So on the uh, the the right upper right hand side of this system here, we have a, uh, a switchboard with a 3,000 amp main with electronic trip. Um, we'll, I don't know if you if we did specific manufacture on this on the following TCCs. I believe we did. Um, what we did here is originally this board this had just squirty. Your squirty. We had uh, um, breakers that were provided on this job, but originally did not fully selectively coordinate across the full uh, time and current ranges. And so on this particular project, we had to turn off instantaneouses and in some cases change out the breaker styles that were UL489 style breakers to UL49C37 style breakers, which will allow you to turn the instantaneous off and or have high instantaneous override. So sometimes on some of these smaller frame breakers, say like on the left there where you have a thousand amp breaker, um, if you put a 10, 12, or 15 times multiplier on that breaker, the maximum that that, that, that will trip at would be 15,000 amps, 15 times 1,000 in the instantaneous. With a high instantaneous override breaker, you can actually turn the instantaneous off and that the breaker will still have an instantaneous trip typically up around 50,000 amps if it's a 65KA IC rated breaker. So it still complies with the UL489 uh, UL requirement, but it get, gives us a greater degree of selective coordination. So what this system here shows is, is sort of a ZSI pathway. And if, Joe, you want to slide to the left there a little bit, and we can follow over to the legally required and emergency system, life safety systems. So ultimately what we did, and go ahead and slide up a little, is we had a legally required ATS on the left and a life safety ATS on the right. And we determined with our life safety system with minimal changes, um, if we provided breakers according to um, our, our rules of thumbs that we talked earlier, you know, uh, four to six times uh, ratio from a main to a branch, et cetera, that we could selectively coordinate our life safety system pretty straightforward. But on our legally required system, typically these are a lot larger boards and systems and can be 800, 1200,000 amps. And so what we ended up doing on the board on the left, which was a legally required board, was these breakers originally were just our kind of your standard thermal mags or, or maybe they were your low end 400 amp frame breakers without ZSI. But in order to selectively coordinate all of these breakers, let's say in this board called ABC1 LR HED1, with the upstream 800 amp breaker, we had to employ the ZSI uh, capability of the electronic trip units on those breakers, even the small 100 amp trip, or excuse me, the uh, 70 amp trip breaker in the middle, um, with the 800 amp breakers upstream. And by employing ZSI, zone selective interlocking, 
what we were able to do was set the 800 amp breaker in the main board very high. Um, may have actually shut it off. If I think, Joe, do we want to go to the next page on this and look at the actual time current curves in the slides? I think this is yeah, where let's go to that. So in this TCC, we follow this pathway for that legally required down to 400. Right. So what we started doing was we looked at the combinations of breakers and the types of trip units that were available. And because the main board, the 4,000 amp board, was a UL891 board, and we employed ZSI, and one thing that we will talk about a little bit later is when you have ZSI, um, breakers that don't receive a restraint signal from a downstream branch or, or breaker downstream, the upstream breaker will actually activate and operate much more quickly. And we do have TCCs to show that. But here the idea was, as we looked at the coordination tables for breaker pairings and came up with breakers that would selectively coordinate. And I think here we're showing the... Yeah, this this example is, it, for these two breakers, is the the selective coordination based on the table. And then here is where we set the ZSI in easy power to, to get it to operate. Right. Yeah, so so one of the options in easy power is you can go to the ZSI tab and you do a, a breaker pairing within the, the program. And this one here shows the 3200 amp main against the 800 amp feeder breaker in the life legally required system. And what you can do is when you fault the bus, if you look in the upper right corner of this TCC, you'll see a little blue bus there. When you actually fault the individual bus, what Easy Power will do is it will, in essence, turn on the unrestrained clearing time of the upstream breaker, in this case, the ABC1 main, and show that this breaker, even though if you were to look at the previous time current curve, had a longer clearing time, when it doesn't receive its restraint signal, its clearing time actually goes as fast as 80 milliseconds, five cycles. So in essence, the board being a UL891 board rated five to six cycles according to Eaton this, or Square D, this particular manufacturer, um, complies with the duty rating of this board. If you flip back one TCC, Joe, just to show kind of how that pink breaker kind of bounces back and forth. So here you can see the pink main is above the 800, but if there was a fault in the board itself, the, the 3200 amp board, that main breaker would actually operate much quicker and clear that fault in uh, 80 milliseconds. So we're not compromising the uh, the, the distribution or the switchboard for a fault in the bus. However, if the fault was beyond the 800 amp breaker, then the main will wait and the next downstream breaker will in fact do the same thing. They they wherever your ZSI is is um, created your ZSI zones, wherever the nearest breaker to the fault is, will operate quickly and only the last breaker in line will be self-restrained and have the actual time that you've you've uh, selected here, which in this case here looks like the, the kind of the cyan colored breaker there, a 400 amp breaker. Correct. And again, the, all of these, all of these other parallel normal system breakers are also uh, connected to that CSI zone and uh, set as last in line. Right, so if, if you were to zoom in on that board there, right below the cursor there, Joe. Yeah, so the board that's called ABC HD1, if there was a fault in that particular board, let's say on the bus or any panels downstream, it wasn't cleared, instead of the 1200 amp breaker and the 3000 amp main, both racing the trip in the instantaneous region, what'll happen is is we've specifically turned off the instantaneous on the 3000 amp main. The 1200 amp breaker will send a restraint signal to the 3000 and say, hey, I see a fault downstream in my, my downstream distribution board, HD1 in this case, and it will tell the upstream main to, hey, 
just wait and let me do my job first. So even though this isn't part of the emergency system, ABC1 HD1, it does follow the intent of the code to prevent the main breaker from tripping for a normal source type board that's parallel and would prevent your emergency system from dropping off offline. And this would be the case where let's say you could have two different utilities serving your emergency load, not just a utility and a generator. So I, I know that that might be a little open to interpretation, but we, we do a lot of design build work and, and that, that's our interpretation of the code. Um, again, to, to protect those life safety and legally required systems. Thank you for that explanation, Joe. And I also wanted to just point out that while these don't appear to coordinate on the TCC, the manufacturer's publication does show that it does coordinate up, up to 30,000 amps. We only had 14,000 amps. And the main thing I want to point out is we did have to make sure that it was not just a standard LJ breaker, that it was a mission critical, um, which has a either 4,000 amp tested combination or 30,000 amp. So moving on to the, the third example of adding impedance to your system. In this example, uh, this was a, a project from last year that had a ATS, a distribution panel, and then on this elevator distribution panel, there were multiple parallel elevators. We're only showing one of them here for this example. So when we build this TCC, the problem that pops up right away is that we have miscoordination at 50 milliseconds or 0.05 seconds. And we again have, uh, this is not a, uh, uh, an exception that we can take because we do have parallel loads on this board. So the solution after uh, multiple RFIs and investigation confirming that we physically could add a transformer and modify the system topology, we added a 150 kVA 480 to 480 transformer into the system to inject impedance in the system. And you will need to watch out for what impedances are available on those transformer sizes to ensure that it is achievable. But we adjusted the impedance as we were running some different scenarios to try and find out what, what we needed. Uh, I don't believe this specific example needed a custom transformer. But we also did remove the main breaker on that distribution panel. And we also changed this upstream uh, feeder breaker to a 400 amp frame instead of a 250 amp frame to get the instantaneous to s slip to the right slightly to, to create a separation. On our fourth example here, this is for um, uh, uh, recommendations. There's a couple different examples I'm, uh, I've got here for feeder bus risers. Um, this example right here has a 250 amp feeder riser and 125 amp main breakers. This project did have Siemens breakers and they were a lot easier to selectively coordinate, but uh, we did need to change some of these thermal magnetic mains to electronic trip. And for another example of, of feeder riser with a tap, um, adding a, a non-fused safety switch and changing this break, this panel to main lugs only. So I'm going to walk you through this specific example with the addition of the non-fuse safety switch. The design originally came in 
this this is the top half of the single line and this is the bottom half continuing on through these feeders the transfer switch fed down to a life safety distribution panel that fed two different risers a south side and a north side and that instead of continuing on that topology over on the north side i'm just showing that as an example but on uh, it was identical to the south side where there were 125 amp feeders, 125 amp main, 125 amp feeder. It's pretty obvious that there's not going to be selectively, selective coordination between these. And then continuing down the system, 125 amp, 125 amp, you would think you had coordination here with the 30 and the 60, but when we look at the TCC, with all of those on here, it is pretty difficult to coordinate. This is the 30 amp branch breaker and the 60 amp main. The upstream 30 amp feeding the transformer and the 125 amp. And so you can see there's a lot of miscoordination. So instead of doing that, we the first approach that we took was to review the panel schedules to look at the load because this is a life safety system. It, it, checking the the uh, the necessary the NEC design load on the system on the panel schedules revealed that we really didn't need a 400 amp system and we could go down in size to a 200 amp that gave us a little bit more flexibility. We, instead of having this distribution panel here, we changed that out to just a tap feeding two safety switches and then remove the main on this panel, in essence, creating a single bus that could be switched. And then removing additional mains downstream and adding just safety switches or few switches and keeping the rest of the topology the system sizing 15 kva transformers consistent uh, 30 amp breakers consistent and the primary driver in reducing from a 400 amp system to a 200 amp system was to uh, get back some of the cost in the feeder that was going up through the riser in the building but you can see on this TCC that it is a lot cleaner to coordinate between the 30 amp branch, the fuse on the secondary, the transformer, the 30 amp primary, and then the 200 amp breaker. We did change this out in order to raise that instantaneous. And at that point, this is the end of our examples. Uh, I'm not seeing any specific questions at present. I don't know. Are you seeing any? I don't see any questions. Yeah, Joe, um, I, I can see the questions here. If you open the question, if you unpark uh, the question block, you could open it up. One of the first questions is talking about example three. Todd's asking, was the addition of the one-to-one -one transformer done to reduce fault current downstream or give you a transformer inrush point to coordinate the upstream breaker with? Yeah, it, it, it was primarily there to reduce the, in, uh, excuse me, to reduce the secondary fault current. So on this TCC, if you look at the cyan uh, time current curve, you'll see the inrush point arrow on the time current curve uh, was reduced down quite, sign quite significantly. If you go to the previous page, Joe, you can see the fault current at that particular branch and breaker was 33,000 amps. Now, by putting in the larger, putting in this one-to-one -one transformer, um, we were able to reduce that fault current on the secondary side to uh, about 33,000 amps or 38,000 amps, it looks like there. And while, yes, the transformer did have inrush, um, we were able to set the upstream breaker, the pink-colored one, with high enough uh, both short time and instantaneous settings to be significantly above the inrush point of the transformer on the primary side. So th there, there are added complexities to adding the transformer in, and, and as Joe mentioned, added costs from for for the installation of this. You know, 
we we uh, we work as a design build contractor also, and and you know we have to work this out very carefully with our project management teams to make sure that anything that we add as a cost of the project to accommodate code can physically go in and you know somehow the cost can be uh, recouped in the project. Another question. And yeah, and go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, Joe, it, it, uh, Jim, it, we're not seeing the. I'm not seeing those questions. Um, so. Yeah, I reason. see them now. It, hey, Joe, if you take the the little dashboard and you drag it out, it, it'll pop out into a little separate pop out. So, uh, I guess I could start at the top. It says, "Can we have the PowerPoint?" And I believe yes. The, um, at least the presentation will be on Easy Power's website. Um, I believe we will be providing the PowerPoint to Easy Power, so I, I would imagine whatever link they provide for that uh, would be available. The second question we see here it says, does this mean the power defense breakers are not situated for a, for coordination? Um, they can be power. You know, the power defense is, believe it or not, a, a relatively new line of breakers, um, and and in some applications, and again, only down to 100 milliseconds, the power defense breakers do work very well. Uh, but we're finding they don't work well in all applications, especially down to the uh, full instantaneous range. So unfortunately, Eaton had to go back on a previous project and completely we requote that job. And it was almost two hundred thousand dollars difference in the gear package for this for this job to go to the um the legacy line of breakers so that's it's it's definitely a challenge when it comes to project costs i'm seeing one uh question here about systems that have a combination of fuses and breakers and i was going to flip to this example it's it's kind of limited uh as as i mentioned at the beginning uh the the first rule of thumb of using fused panel boards uh that that's recommended primarily for your your uh, branch breaker branch panels at the end of your system um but it can sometimes benefit to to slip a fuse in 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 between some breakers, but it can be also difficult to, to coordinate them at times. Here's a, a good question from Brad Garrison. He, he mentions here he had a project where he had a set of 1200 amp uh, switch gear and the cu customer chose to go with miscoordination to reduce his uh, arc flash levels. Um, and, and so the question says, you know, what which is more important in terms of the NEC arc flash reduction or coordination. And I can say that one of the things that uh, we Rosenden have been doing for the last probably 10 to 12 years is doing a combination of both where we get both the coordination and the arc flash levels down. And in fact, with implementation of ZSI zone selective interlocking, um, it's one of the easiest ways to get your arc flash down within a board itself. And if the, the board's main breaker is talking to an upstream breaker via ZSI, that you can get the arc flash down on the input side. Another trade-off or advantage to that um, is per article 240.87 is you either have to put in energy reduction mode switches or ZSI. Those are one of the two options. And so we have found that as a cost trade-off, that ZSI actually fulfill, fulfills the function of bringing arc flash down in the gear and allows us selective coordination. The unfortunate thing is all of these things cost money. And that's usually where the customer has the greatest challenges when you come back to them and say, well, code is requiring us to do these things and it's going to cost additional money to implement them. And so we try to be very upfront when we're quoting jobs from the construction perspective or the study perspective that we let customers and project managers know that there may be conditions that they're going to come into where costs can be incurred and that we let people know in advance.
of um, additional costs that co could come out of code code requirements. So there's also a question here, how responsive are designers to making changes, assuming you are not the design firm? And uh, Joe, feel free to jump in also, but this is something that we have run into quite a bit. And uh, I, would, I would say that initially there is some, some pushback, but as the, the conversation gets going, when we are uh, doing a, a a plan and spec bid build project that has an outside design engineer, we've had really good success with uh, walking through the the recommended changes and and um, redesigning the system slightly. Uh, there's often multiple rounds of meetings to ensure that the redesigned system is still meeting the requirements and expectations of the owner for controllability of being able to isolate this panel without taking out a whole uh, feeder riser. Um, but for the most part, we've had a lot of success with uh, working with outside design firms to to um, improve the uh, coordination of a system. The, there, it's been a slightly different working with the vendors that uh, we're uh, receiving submittal packages for when they are in-house design build projects. And I don't know if you want to mention anything about that, but. We, we've had some aggressive pushback from, from vendors and then, uh, you know, it'll come to turn after six or eight months on a project and then they realize yeah we should have been doing what what we were asked to do six or eight months previous so it can go both ways um, there's another good question I see here it says uh, did the non fuse disconnect disconnect switches have a short circuit rating greater than the available fault current and did you address that and yes we, we didn't talk about that um, with the ATS's and fuse disconnects we do, do always check that our ATS's um, have the appropriate withstand and close ratings with respect to the style breaker and model number that's upstream and, and all ATS manufacturers have uh, rating charts for that as do the non-fused safety switches, Square D, GE, um, Eaton, they all have um, their rating guides for per UL98 to ensure that non-fuse disconnects work in combination with the upstream breaker. Typically, we, we recommend to our own purchasing agent that we buy the disconnects from the same manufacturer of the breakers that we're buying um, with the gear especially if it's non-OEM gear, like if you're with like Russ, Russ Electric or IEM, uh, that they're using OEM breakers that, that you know, we buy. If we're buying Square D breakers, buy the appropriate Square D uh, safety switch. And not to specifically put in a plug for Cummins, they recently came out with the, I believe it was the X-Series transfer switches that that don't have tested combination breakers. They just have um, a, a really solid uh, time -based. short time ratings, time-based yeah, time ratings. Based. Yep. They do uh, down to 50 milliseconds and they do to... Um, Thir I think 30 cycles. They they have two, and and so they they really opened it up. And and we we had a really challenging project about a year ago with Cummins ATSs, and their ATSs didn't work with anything. And a year later, now they have much more advanced tables and and rated rated um, ATSs. So the manufacturers are getting on board with a lot of this. They're starting to realize too that. You know, they're they're having the same challenges being presented to them that are coming out of the code, just as we do from the coordination study aspect. Gentlemen, it looks like we're at the end of our time uh, guide. For any questions we weren't able to get to, we'll be able to close to, uh, attach a Q&A uh, response where we uh, put the link to the video. So there'll be a copy of. I have uh, the slides and the video.
in the Q&A response uh, posted on the Easy Power website by the end of next week. Thank you very much for uh, the presentation, excellent information, and uh, hope to look forward to you guys working with us down the road. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Jim. All right, take care. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.